Chapter 2. The show goes on. If you're in such a frightful rush, I might summon up my pumpkin coach and drive you home in style, Penny laughed. Would you like that, Lou? I'd be grateful for anything on four wheels, sighed Louise. I do wish we had brought your car now. Penny's car, variously known to the girls as the Leaping Tiger, the bus, the junk wagon, had been purchased secondhand with money faithfully earned by doing sundry unpleasant tasks about the Parker home. In outward appearance, the shiny blue coupe looked very nearly like a new model, but it had a disconcerting way of breaking down at inconvenient intervals. Penny's father, Anthony Parker, editor of the Riverview Star, had spoken pearls of wisdom when he declared that the car would teach his daughter bitter lessons in finance and mechanics. It happens that, as usual, my taxi is in Simpson's garage, explained Penny, but the place is just around the corner. Joe promised he'd have it fixed by 12 today. The girls reached the end of the block and turned in at the garage. A man in a greasy coveralls assured Penny that her automobile was ready to be driven away. How much will it be this time, Joe? Oh, make it two dollars, he answered carelessly. I'll give you a special price because you're such a steady customer. Penny laughed and paid the bill. She slid behind the steering wheel and with Louise beside her, backed out into the street. The motor had a smooth sound. We'll try Clinton Boulevard, Penny decided. That's the quickest route to your home. The car rallied down the wide, shady street. Penny kept the arrow of the speedometer steady at 30 miles an hour. A large black automobile whizzed past so close that the girls could imagine they heard the fender scrape. Look at that fellow go, exclaimed Louise indignantly. Doing 60 easy. He missed us just by inches. I wish the speed cop would get him. Drivers like him are a menace. The girls could see the big car flashing on down the road. Whenever another vehicle loomed up, the driver loudly sounded his horn. Suddenly, Louise gave a frightful cry. Oh, I knew it! I knew it! In trying to pass, the black car had sideswiped a large gray limousine. To the horror of the girls, the gray automobile swerved into a ditch, turning sideways as a sharp angle. Penny saw the black car slacken pace momentarily. The driver, a man, peered backward towards the damaged automobile, but he did not halt. Get his license number, Lou, Penny cried. 386. Oh, I lost the other two numbers. And so did I. No use chasing him either. This old car wouldn't overtake a snail. Pulling up near the gray limousine, the girls sprang from their car and ran to see if anyone had been seriously hurt. A uniformed chauffeur had managed to get the rear door open and helped a young woman out. The angle of the tilted car was so steep that she could not climb out by her own efforts. Are you injured, Miss Harmon? The man asked anxiously. I, I think I'm all right, James. The young woman murmured, just badly shaken. Penny held the car door open, and the chauffeur lifted Miss Harmon to the ground. She leaned weakly against him for a moment. What happened? She asked in a dazed voice. The first thing I knew, we were in the ditch. That road hog in the black car struck us, said the chauffeur angrily, and he was too cowardly to stop. The first three numbers of his auto license were 386, Louise declared. The police may be able to trace him. For the first time, the young woman became aware of the girls. Did you see the accident, she inquired? Yes, we did, replied Penny. The man very nearly struck our own car. He was taking all of the road. I wish you would give me your name, said the young woman. If the man should be traced, I may need you as witnesses. While Penny and Louise were writing down their addresses on a card, the chauffeur inspected the limousine. The car doesn't appear damaged, except for the fender, he said. We rolled into the ditch pretty easy. Miss Harmon glanced at her wristwatch. 
a tiny gold oval set with large diamonds. She was a beautiful woman. Her clothes were very expensive, but Penny thought them a little extreme. It is after 1.30 now, James, she declared anxiously. We have only 25 minutes to reach the theater. Can you make it? I'll do my best, Miss Harmon. The chauffeur climbed in the front seat of the limousine. He was able to start the motor, but when he shifted gears, there was no movement, only a loud grinding roar. I can't drive it out, Miss Harmon, he said. We're in too steep of an angle. I'll have to go for a garage man. Oh dear, then we'll never reach the theater in time, and I must be there. Miss Harmon took, turned quickly towards Penny. Do you have, do you know of a taxi stand nearby here? Not on Clinton Boulevard, returned Penny, but if you wish, I'll be glad to take you there to the theater in my car. Oh, my dear, you saved my life, Miss Harmon exclaimed. I'm due to go on at the Rialto at two o'clock, and it would ruin me if I'm late. Are you an actress, Louise asked in awe. Yes, I have played various roles, but at present I'm in a dancing act. Surely you have heard my name. Helene Harmon? Of course, said Penny, giving Louise a sharp dig in the ribs. The Rialto ran a half-page advertisement in Dad's newspaper yesterday. I'm the headliner at the Rialto, Miss Harmon declared in a pleased tone. She glanced again at her watch, reminding the girls, We have just 20 minutes now. We'll get you to the theater in time, unless the car breaks down. Miss Harmon laughed pleasantly, never guessing that Penny's remark had been met in seriousness. She took a little suitcase makeup kit from her limousine and followed the girls to the blue coop. Everything has gone wrong since I struck this town three days ago, she sighed as they drove along. First I lost my Marie, my French maid, who has been with me for years. That upset me, for the new girl is very indifferent. And now this accident? You were fortunate to escape without serious injury, Louise ventured. Yes, I might have been horribly crippled or scarred. Then my career as a dancer would end. The thought frightens me. With a shiver, the young woman leaned her head back against the cushion. Her face was pale. How are you feeling? All right, Miss Herman, Louise asked. Perhaps we should take you to a doctor instead of to the theater. Perish the thought, my dear. The show must go on, you know. My nerves are a bit shattered now, but I'm an old trooper. I'll push myself through it when I reach the theater. Closing her eyes, Miss Harmon appeared to relax. She no more, and Penny concentrated her full attention upon the road. Soon they were threading through the dense city traffic with the minutes ticking rapidly away. Only ten minutes left, Louise warned, as they passed the large clock in the jewelry store window. Miss Harmon straightened up, glanced at her own watch, and opened her makeup box. With deft strokes, she began to apply grease paint, carmine lipstick, and eyelash darkener. Louise watched in fascination. I look grotesque now, the dancer smiled, but under the lights, these colors will tone down. Having my makeup on will save me five minutes. A truck loomed ahead, and Penny's face grew tense. She could not get around, and the driver made no heed to the polite toot of the coupe's horn. We'll never make it, Miss Harmon said nervously. I'm due to go on exactly at two, and it will take me five minutes to get into my dancing costume. I'll get you there, Penny said grimly. She backed the car around, turning into a narrow alley. This isn't Riverview's most scenic route, but it will take us to the stage door. A moment later, the car pulled up at the rear entrance of the Rialto Theater. Miss Herman quickly alighted. Please don't go away until you have seen the show, she said hurriedly. Park your car and come inside. I wish to talk to you later. Thrusting two pieces of pasteboard into Louise's hand, the young woman disappeared through the stage door. Do, 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 do.